Welcome back to the second hour of a special edition of The Readout. As Donald Trump was back on the campaign trail this weekend for his 2024 presidential bid, we're learning more about his efforts to overturn the results of the last presidential election. The Washington Post is reporting on Trump's pressure campaign toward then Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. You may remember this infamous moment in November of 2020 when Governor Ducey was in the midst of certifying President Biden's win when he received a call with the ringtone, Hail to the Chief, that he quickly sent to voicemail. We later learned that it was Trump himself on the other end of that call that Ducey declined to answer. They later connected, but Ducey never said what the call was about. According to the Post, it was Trump pushing to get the governor to overturn the election results. The Post reports four people familiar with the call said Trump spoke specifically about his shortfall of more than 10,000 votes in Arizona and then espoused a range of false claims that he said would show that he overwhelmingly won the election in the state. And he encouraged Ducey to study them. Adding, two of those people say Trump repeatedly asked Vice President Mike Pence to call Ducey and prod him to find evidence to substantiate Trump's claims of fraud. In an interview over the weekend, Pence confirmed that he did check in with Ducey, but denied ever ex exerting any pressure. Of course, it wouldn't be the only time Trump would pressure a state official to overturn the state's election results. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. Now, I should note that Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger met with investigators from special counsel Jack Smith's office last week in their investigation into Trump's role in trying to reverse his 2020 defeat. The Post also notes that it's unclear if Ducey has been contacted by Smith's office over his call. And new reporting from The Wall Street Journal indicates that the special counsel's investigation has taken a growing interest in the role Trump's lawyers and other figures played in the efforts to overturn Trump's loss, including creating slates of fake electors. That includes issuing subpoenas and asking questions centered on several key figures in those efforts, like Trump's so-called elite strike force of the Kraken lady, Sidney Powell, Rudy Giuliani, and Jenna Ellis, among others. The journal also provided more details on the recent interview between federal prosecutors and Giuliani, citing, among other things, of interest was a December 2020 meeting in the Oval Office, during which Powell pitched a plan to have the U.S. military seize control of the voting machines. Also of interest was the role of lawyer John Eastman, the brains, if one wants to call it that, behind the fake electors memo. Joining me now is MSNBC Justice and legal analyst Anthony Coley. He's a former DOJ spokesperson under Attorney General Merrick Garland. And Charles Coleman, former Brooklyn prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst. Thank you both for being here. Anthony, I do want to start with you because the, the, the sense that one gets in looking at all the different places uh, that Jack Smith is looking and sort of burrowing um, is that there is a potential that there could be another active case against Donald Trump based on a lot of things. Um, we had been thinking uh, it was more about perhaps a second fake documents uh, or showing, sorry, classified documents case, maybe in New Jersey uh, or specifically on the January 6th insurrection. But this feels more about the pressure campaign. How do you see it? Right. I think that's exactly right, Joy. There is a lot we do not know about this investigation and all of the lawyers you just mentioned, Giuliani and others, they have a right to be concerned, uh, but they shouldn't be surprised here. Right. I think uh, all of us know that um, there was a series of court rulings, uh, about 60 different federal courts in the winter of 2020, that found that all of these election charges didn't have any real legal merit. Um, and Bill Barr himself, then he was sitting in the seat uh, as the United States Attorney General. He said very publicly to the Associated Press and to others that there wasn't enough uh, fraud in the 2020 election to change the outcome of that election. So um, it shouldn't be really a surprise to uh, to, to anyone uh, of these of these lawyers. Uh, my hope is that uh, what we are seeing from 
uh, Jack Smith and his prosecutors, despite some of the rhetoric, right, they have, in many cases, uh, Trump has called him deranged. He has attacked this man's wife, um, Jack Smith's wife. What we are seeing is Jack Smith determined to pursue justice uh, without fear or favor. And I think everyone who loves freedom and truth and, and law uh, should be happy about that. And the last thing I'll say, Joy, is to your uh, to your to your question, um, this Justice Department is uh, following the facts wherever they lead. And that's what we should all hope for in any criminal investigation. You know, and there's also the case, uh, you know, Ms. Melissa Murray, uh, Charles uh, Coleman, she coined the term making attorneys get attorneys is what MAGA really stands right. for. And I wonder how fearful, Charles, um, some of these attorneys ought to be, the Jenna Ellis's, the strike force folks, um, because it does seem like they are, like, like the Justice Department is zeroing back in on the fake elector scheme that a lot of Trump's lawyers had something to do with. Well, Joy, I'm not convinced that MAGA is not about to stand for my attorneys got arrested in a little while. And I do think that it's really important that we identify the irony here. Let's focus for a quick second on the fact that right now Donald Trump is actively campaigning and peddling a narrative around the DOJ, supposedly interfering with an election, when in fact he is also under investigation in multiple jurisdictions for having actually interfered in the last election. And so I just think the irony of that is important to point out to viewers and to the public to understand that as he peddles this narrative, if anyone knows what election interference is, it's actually him because he's actually someone who in multiple states is under investigation for that. That being said, I do think that Jack Smith is doing what a prosecutor does. And as Anthony already pointed out, you have to follow the facts wherever they take you. It's important to understand that this may be distinctly different from the Georgia case in as much as with that case, with, with, with Raffensperger, we actually have the phone call, we have the recording, we know what was said, and we know it was clear. Whereas with this case, it's kind of left up to the interpretation of the different accounts of first Mike Pence and then the other people who were on the call as to the degree of pressure which was being placed on Donald Trump. So from a legal standpoint, what that's going to mean is Everything comes back to the timeline. What did you know at the time that you made these calls? And then what were what was said on the actual calls? And so I think that is going to be the linchpin that determines whether a prosecution moves forward with respect to Arizona as compared to Georgia, where you have the actual recording and you know what was said. Good point. And to stay with you just for a second, Charles, because the, the, the other thing is right. We don't know what Trump might have to fear from what a Mike Pence might say or a Doug Ducey might say to Jack Smith. But there are other people. Um, so former Trump campaign official named uh, Mike Roman, who was involved in efforts to put forward these slates of electors, um, he potentially was involved, and this was a White House official. And then there is also a, a, a sort of female member of Trump's orbit. Um, who was actually apparently shown documents, maybe potentially in New Jersey, um, who are folks are talking about, who's still involved in Trump world. And she was a campaign aide to him. Her name is Susie Wiles, one of his most trusted advisors. She's actually leading, she was leading his reelection effort uh, and works for his PAC, allegedly was shown a classified map in August of, or September of 2021. When people like that are getting dragged before the before Jack Smith's grand jury. How does that work when they're still in his orbit? Well, it's a very big deal when you're talking about the fact that they're still connected to Donald Trump, because the question really becomes, as a prosecutor, what is it going to take for you to fold? How much pressure right. is it going to take for you to begin to understand that if you do not cooperate, if you do not let us know what it is that you know, you could potentially be going down with a sinking ship. And so the fact that they're still connected to Donald Trump is not only an indication of his own bravado, but perhaps their level of allegiance, which for most people just does not jive with common sense in as much as you see that this is a person who is being indicted at this point on the federal level uh, by Jack Smith, on, this, on the local level by Alvin Bragg, and potentially uh, forthcoming charges on the state level with Fonnie Willis and elsewhere. And so is this something that you want to continue to be associated with, or are you going to try to cut a deal with the DOJ, let them know what you know, and basically get off this sinking ship?
Accuse Stephanie Grisham, Anthony. Let me just play what she said. She is another former yeah. uh, White House aide uh, on the press side. And this is what she says, not that she heard, but what she saw. Take a look. Look, you know Donald Trump. Is it plausible Trump was showing classified documents to people in private meetings? The short answer is yes. I watched him show uh, documents to people at Mar-a-Lago on the, uh, the dining room patio. So he has no respect for classified information, never did. Uh, I, mean, what, what, I mean, what's the over under on literally everyone who worked around Trump and everyone who's been in line with his PAC eventually being before this grand jury, because it seems like there are endless people that Jack Smith could talk to. There are endless people, and I just, I, 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 you know, I, I shouldn't be surprised anymore, Joy, when I hear stuff like that, but it still um, boggles the mind that um, this former president, this president, Donald Trump, could be so cavalier with our nation's, um, some of our nation's uh, top secrets. We're talking about things that, at its core, um, could put the men and women in our military at risk. We're talking about people who could put our assets at, at risk. And the fact that he is going around in such a cavalier manner, showing things off on a patio, I just really speaks to the fact that he, quite honestly, shouldn't have had access to this information uh, to start with. Having to be kidnapped from my home yeah. as a 15-year-old child, to be lodged in the belly of the beast, right. I was gifted to turn that experience into the womb of America. Right. I was gifted because I was able to see it for what it really was. A system that was trying to make me believe that I was my ancestor's wildest nightmare. But I am my ancestor's wildest dream. That was exonerated five member Yusuf Salam declaring victory in the primary for Harlan's city council seat after he appeared to win by a landslide. It is a stunning moment for Salam, who three decades ago was one of the five black teenagers who Donald Trump said should be put to death after they were falsely accused of raping a white woman in Central Park. Now, Salam will get to be an advocate for his community, while Trump is facing two indictments with more than 30 counts each in federal court and in state court in New York. Karma is real. Youssef Salam joins me now. Um, well, I have to start by saying congratulations to you. And I have to just, you know, per one point of personal privilege, it's just such a wonderful feeling um, having gotten to know you through the newspaper um, as also a teenager only a little older than you and going through the agonizing hell from way outside in the safety of my auntie's home um, and getting to talk to you now in this situation when you are about to represent Harlem um, in the city council it just it, it is a good feeling and I wonder what that feeling is like for you. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still, it's, it's a dream. I'm still living, I'm on cloud nine. I gotta tell you, you know, the memory of everything that I've gone through is like full circle. Being able to understand that that which I came through was to make sure that I was prepared for what the next journey would come, like what would come on the, on the journey. This door that opened up, the fact that I can speak truth to power, the fact that I can carry the voices of people who have been counted out, pushed to the back, into the halls of power, my very own Harlem home. This is such a beautiful thing for me, for Harlemites. I, I'm, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm still, I'm still. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can only moment. imagine. Isn't I can only. Well, I wonder if you had time to like sort of step back and think about, you know, what your experiences, the horrific experiences you had, um, but also the sort of galvanizing impact of the public rooting for you all um, and fighting for you all and so many people who never let you all be forgotten um, all the way through your exoneration and subsequent cases against the city of New York. What has that hmm. taught you that you are going to then bring to the table, you know, from all of those experiences as a representative of your community? 
You know, that's taught me that as a person who has 10 children, who part of my, many of my children, in fact, are part of the group of people who have created new language that we are all trying to understand, things like YOLO and things of that nature, right? And I remember when I first heard the term YOLO, immediately when it was explained to me, I realized that in the young person's mind, when they've seen George Floyd get murdered, Breonna Taylor get murdered, you know, Trayvon Martin, of course, wearing a hoodie, playing your music if you're in Florida, you know, Ramali Graham here, Eric Gardner in Staten Island, you know, it, it occurred to me that in the young person's mind, they don't believe that there's a tomorrow. And so there's a certain sense of hopelessness that we're living through. And here we are 34 years later, looking at this whole trajectory of the experience, the arc of moral justice, if you will. Here I was 15 years old and now I'm 49. And I think what I represent really is the fact that it's possible that young people can look at a person like me and say, if he was able to grow through something like that, I most def definitely can get through anything. Because if you can understand the why, right? Why did I go through that? Why was I, was, why, why did I grow through that, right? I gotta change that language. Why did I grow through that? I grew through it in order to understand the system from the inside out so that when the time came, I could really be an advocate for our people understanding really what the pain points are. If I, as I've often said, those who have been close to the pain have to have a seat at the table and what better way to lead than to serve our people. Uh, amen to that. Uh, you took the ad that uh, Donald Trump took out against you and uh, your brothers, uh, and you turned it into your own ad. <laughs> and uh, he said, bring back the death penalty. What you said uh, is that now that you've been indicted and are facing criminal charges, I do not resort to hatred, bias, or racism as you once did, even though 34 years ago you actively called for my death and the death of four other innocent children. I wish you no harm. Uh, that is incredible grace. Uh, and you're a gracious man. Uh, and I wonder if uh, your brothers uh, sort of agree with that sort of sentiment of kind of moving past it and whether you've talked to them since uh, you won this resounding primary victory and what they think of all of this. I gotta tell you, they are definitely, oh my goodness, this is just such a proud moment. You know, I've gotten so many cheers from our group, from my, my sacred brotherhood that it's been amazing, amazing, amazing. You know, I, I'm, I'm quite aware of statements like our great James Baldwin, where he said to be African-American is to be African without memory and American without privilege. And so here we are, and I'm, my, my, my words really is that I have hope. I have hope that we can one day become the United States of America as opposed to the divided states of America. Hope that one day we will really be able to see equality and in fact, also experience equity. You know, so much has transpired and much of it is really to get us to believe that we were second class citizens. You know, even when I look at the documents that founded this country, we the people, it starts. And if we just take a pregnant pause, black and brown people, black people in general, were not considered a whole human being. And so, you know, to have the, the, the community lift me up, to have my brothers that I experienced this with you know, be along for the ride. They're here for all of it. They they enjoy it. They love it. I mean, it is so full circle. And I got to tell you, I can't go anywhere now without someone saying, can I take a picture with you? And I love that because I represent that hope that we all need. I represent the fact that we have to begin to count on ourselves, bet on ourselves. We have to begin to also plan in 50 to 100 year cycles. Because if we plan, or we don't have a plan, if we say, we're not guaranteed tomorrow and we start living in hopelessness continue hopeless living for five years you will be in a hole that you can't get out of we have to live yeah. on purpose and with purpose and all know that we are our ancestors wildest dreams that yeah that is a sermon and I, the first time i got to finally meet you in person you know what i said can i take a picture with you and the next time i see you i want to also take another picture with you i'm so proud of you and uh i'm so excited for you and for harlem and for new york and Thank for all of us for the culture Yusuf Salam. Doctor, let me get it right. Dr. Yusuf Salam. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate you so much. They'll be here in five. We ready? There's a... Oh. Love. Fourth of July, during a time in America when a lot of people are seeing their freedoms being taken away. And that is in large part due to the Supreme Court of the United States. Mainly, the court's six conservative judges 
whose decisions last week, peeling back some rights and protections Americans have enjoyed for decades, were tainted by corruption. And no, I'm not just talking about Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito's fancy billionaire-funded vacations. I'm talking about their total disregard for the idea of standing, the legal concept that lawsuits in any court can't just be brought on the grounds that an individual or group is unhappy with whatever the law is. That is not how it works. The plaintiff has to actually suffer some kind of injury. It's pretty basic stuff. But apparently six of the justices on the highest court in our country must have all missed that day in law school, as they've demonstrated in some of their latest rulings. 303 Creative versus Elenis, for example. The case that basically gave businesses across the country a green light to deny services to customers if they are LGBTQ. That was all based on a completely made up scenario. Plaintiff Lori Smith, backed by the far right Christian group Alliance Defending Freedom, sued the state of Colorado because she wanted to make wedding websites someday, but didn't want to make them for gay couples because it goes against her religion. But here's the catch. No gay couple ever asked her to make a website for them. According to court, rule, court filings from the plaintiff, a man named Stewart contacted Smith in September 2016 about his wedding to Mike. He wrote that they would love some design work done for our invites, place names, maybe even a website. Well, the New Republic reached out to this Stewart to learn that not only did he never once ask Smith for any of this, he's not even gay. He's been married to a woman for 15 years. And that call with the New Republic was the first time he had even heard about the case. Meaning, what is now the law of the land was all completely based on a hypothetical. Whether or not they had standing was completely irrelevant, however. And this is a pattern. The case ending affirmative action, for example, was brought by another far-right group, led by conservative activist Ed Blum, who is white. That group argued that Harvard's and the University of North Carolina's policies discriminated against Asian Americans. But here's the weird thing. No Asian American students came forward to testify to having experienced said discrimination. In fact, the only students, Asian American or otherwise, who testified were in favor of race conscious admissions. And with the student loan forgiveness decision, the court ruled in favor of six red states who were challenging President Biden's executive order not actual students who had loans or debt. But the Supreme Court doesn't care who the plaintiff might be, if they have any involvement with the case, or if, if they even exist. If the plaintiffs don't have standing, the six conservative justices will just make it up. Whatever it takes to keep handing down these draconian decisions that align with their political ideology and right-wing religious views, and that keep the right-wing billionaires who take care of them happy and fueling up those private jets. Joining me now, is Melissa Gira Grant, staff writer for The New Republic, Dino Badala, MSNBC columnist and host of The Dino Badala Show on Sirius XM, and Maya Wiley, president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, Melissa, welcome to the show. I do want to start with you. Let's talk about this 303 case, because it seems to me that it is a case based on a completely made up thing and a man who didn't know he had any involvement with it. And you're, it's I think you've done some reporting on it. Yeah, I started the reporting on it. Um, this case is based on something even more made up than this individual inquiry for a wedding website. So the the main claim that Alliance Defending Freedom was bringing in this case was that their client was not allowed to even advertise her business making wedding websites, which did not exist. So there's a business that didn't exist. She's not allowed to advertise throughout business, they said allegedly because of an anti-discrimination law, which is the law they have now eroded. Um, and then in the midst of that, they bring this inquiry from an alleged same-sex couple. Um, ADF is spinning right now. They're trying to say, oh, this doesn't matter. We brought this on much bigger grounds, but like two things to know about that. The much bigger grounds are actually even more imaginary than this inquiry, if that's possible. You know, she has yet to advertise for this service and they're saying it's a pre-enforcement challenge and yes, those exist and ADF often loses them actually when they're on the other side. So this is something that was meant to affirm the religious rights of this woman, Lori Smith, and people like her at the expense of queer and trans people. ADF can spin it however they want right now, but the reality is this person whose name is on the inquiry, Stuart, 
he didn't make it. There is no genuine same-sex wedding inquiry behind this. And ADF attested in court that there was. And, and just, to, just to be clear, Melissa, did you talk to Stuart? Yes, yes. I found Stuart's contact information in the course of going through court filings. And when I spoke with him, I expected him to say, you know, oh, God, I've heard from a million reporters. Like, here's another one. But he hadn't. No one had called him before. He had no knowledge that his name appeared in this court filing. He had actually heard of the case because by the time I called him, like last Tuesday, the case had been argued at the Supreme Court and it was in the news a little bit at the end of last year. So he actually knew about it in the context of his work as a designer. Like that's the other kind of ridiculous thing here, right? Like he's a designer. Why would he be trying to hire another designer to make this non existent wedding website? So he was, I mean, he's somebody who supports LGBTQ rights, he supports abortion rights, um, everything that ADF is for, everything that this case is about, he stands against that. And it's just a very disorienting experience for somebody who's truly just a private person who, for reasons that are still unclear, his information now has become part of this case as if he is a, a real half of a same-sex couple. And, he, and just to be clear again, he's not part of a same-sex couple because he himself is not gay. Correct. Yes. Stuart is married to a woman. Stuart has been married to a woman for more than a decade. Um, you know, I'm just like a little anxious to get into the particulars of who he is because he is truly a private sure. person and lots of people have been calling him. Um, also, given the reality of this case and who ADF is allied with, I think his concerns yeah. for harassment and backlash are pretty significant. Um, and I think that, you know, I've spent a lot of time texting with him, talking with him, and my sense of him is that there's just no reason on earth that he would have placed this inquiry. And also to be very, very clear, I don't know for sure. I don't live inside Stewart's computer. It may come out yeah. that he did. Even if that is the case, what ADF is claiming that this is a genuine inquiry, that's still false. Okay, so I, I want to establish all of that, Maya, before I come to you to ask how this is not illegal, deeply unethical. We're going to come back to ADF in a moment. But this sounds like a completely specious case. How could it have possibly come before the Supreme Court? And how could they go through oral arguments and go through this entire case and that never come up? You know, let me just say, Jerry, first of all, Melissa, thanks for that reporting, because, you know, when you bring a case, you're supposed to have what's called a case or controversy. That means something has to actually have happened to you. It's part of what we think about the courts. You have to have something called standing, which is that you are supposed to say that you have had some form of palpable injury. And I think what Melissa has walked us through is exactly the point of there was no case, there was no controversy, there was not even any stated injury because she didn't have a business. And this did come up in lower courts uh, and, you know, ADF kept changing its filings to try to assert that it had something there, including months after it filed its original complaint, kind of updating it to show this al alleged um, uh, request that appears to be false. So I think at the end of the day, you know, you said it right, Joy, when you said this isn't supposed to happen. You aren't supposed to be able to get all the way up to the Supreme Court without any factual case that demonstrates that you should be able to be in court in the first place. And on one level, if in fact this was fabricated, it would be a felony because you have to affirm under oath that would make it perjury if it's untrue. Uh, but, but I think the end of it, the day, it goes back to your other point, is the Supreme Court wanted to take this case, even though it blew in the face of decades of, of Supreme Court precedent that said, you know what, you don't have to open a business. If you are religious and have strong views, you are allowed to have those views, but that doesn't mean you're allowed to deny anyone else service if you open a service business. And what it did is say, we don't care. Well, I mean, we know that they're trying to enact their religious and political views. I think that's very clear. But the, the, the one more specific question before I bring Dean in for you, Maya, should there be and can there be sanctions against the attorneys? I mean, can they keep their bar licenses after making up a fake case and arguing it? And can there be sanctions against the members of the Supreme Court 
who knowingly affirmed a, ca a case with attestations that were lies? Well, first, uh, uh, someone can always ask for a disciplinary proceeding against the attorneys. Of course, like all things, there has to be evidence that they, in fact, knew that there were attestations that were not fact-based. So, like all things, we want to see due process, but absolutely on sanctions. Uh, there's something called Rule 11 in the federal courts where you can be sanctioned and actually find money for not paying attention to the rules of the court. In terms of the Supreme Court, you know, as we know, we need ethics reform. As we know, uh, the only way to really go after any Supreme Court justices for wrongdoing is impeachment. Uh, and we are pushing very hard for ethics reform as a civil rights community, as a leadership conference on civil and human rights, because we simply can't have a Supreme Court and law of the land that the people can't trust. Well, you can get 67 members of the United States Senate. Think about your voting when you vote for the Senate, because if you've got 67 Democrats in there who are willing to impeach one or more of them, they could win an impeachment. That is the way it works, just like with the president. One year after... Alive with delicious Mexican flavors. Daily Mix. Find us in the frozen aisle. One year after... Roe v. Wade's reversal, the anti-abortion front is intensifying its war on women. bodies. In North Carolina, a new law has just gone into effect that restricts most abortions after 12 weeks of pregnancy, bringing its limit down from 20 weeks. Anti-choice conservatives know abortion bans are unpopular among Americans. Remember, their extremist stance cost them dearly in the midterms. And so they're relying on a tactic we've seen with voting rights. They can't win, so they cheat. That tactic is underway in several red states such as Ohio, where Republican lawmakers set up an August special election to decide whether to make it harder to amend the state constitution. Make no mistake, this scheme is about abortion. For more than a century, Ohio voters could amend the state constitution with a simple majority of more than 50% of the vote. But this special election will decide whether future amendments will instead need the approval of 60% of the electorate. The move will make it harder for voters in November who will decide on a possible ballot measure to codify abortion rights in the state constitution. Joining me now is Kelly Copeland, Executive Director of Pro-Choice Pro Ohio, and Aaron Haynes, MSNBC political contributor and editor-at-large for the 19th. Thank you both for being here, Ms. Copeland. Um, let's talk about this. Who is behind this move to make it a 60% threshold in Ohio? And do you agree, am I right or wrong, that this is about abortion? It is, of course, about abortion, just as you've said and just as they've admitted. Um, we have a state that is controlled by a gerrymandered legislature, um, and they don't, they don't want you to have a voice in your reproductive health care decisions or in your governance. That's why they've put this special election on the August ballot, because they know that Ohioans are poised to vote to amend our state constitution so that we have guaranteed reproductive rights going forward but they think that they're gonna lose. And frankly, I do too. That's why they're trying to change the rules. That's why they're putting a special election on in August, a time when many people are on vacation because they wanna change the rules. They wanna say, oh, we've had 100%, 100 years of majority rule, one person, one vote, but we're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna ask you to dilute your voice and only you know, be able to pass things by 60%. It's the, it's the most clear indication I've ever seen from them that they know they're out of step with Ohioans. Um, let's go through this. Um, 
there, the, the person who's behind this Ohio amendment, uh, according to CBS News, found that the Republican effort um, is one flank in a coordinated nationwide campaign. This is CBS's reporting. Heavily funded by Republican mega donor Richard Uline to raise the threshold to pass any citizen uh, initiated amendment. Uline, he's based in Chicago. He's a billionaire, Republican mega donor who has supported groups involved in, oh, the January 6th effort and subsequent efforts to overturn election. So, Aaron, once again, we come back to the same kind of billionaires who want to restrict voting rights overall are also funding efforts to restrict abortion. Your thoughts? Yeah, Joy. I mean, look, we are in a moment where we are having a conversation about the overall erosion of rights. Uh, the Ohio case is some, something that we've been covering uh, at the 19th, as, as well as uh, these abortion bans that are that are literally changing in real time. I would direct anybody that's watching your show to watch, we um, to, to go to our website at 19thnews.org. We have a dashboard that is literally kind of laying out the, the situation state by state, and, and we are updating that uh, sometimes even on a daily basis as, as things change either in state legislatures or in the courts. But but yes, I mean, you've got both sides basically working overtime to outmaneuver the other uh, on the other side of Dobbs. If anybody thought that that thing, you know, that this abortion fight was going to be over after that ruling a year later, I think that, that we are very clear that that is absolutely not the situation. And Aaron, you know, just stay with you for just a moment. So there's a Florida bill that is already underway to try to make it so that they that any citizen required initiative would need 66.67 percent. That actually failed to pass. It had passed the House, but it made no headway in the Senate. It would have required that. Uh, it, it, they're getting so extreme because it's very clear that ending abortion access is very politically unpopular. Um, just in your reporting. Is there any group of Republicans in any state that has reacted to the unpopularity of this by trying to slow down? Because it seems to me like they're they're speeding it up. They're getting more aggressive about trying to ban abortion. The more women say we don't want it. Yeah, it, it certainly doesn't seem to be the case, Joy. And, and even more to your point, what we also did not see happening in state legislatures and in the wake of Dobbs and, and in this past legislative session earlier this year, you didn't see Republican-controlled legislatures who uh, you know, were passing uh, laws to restrict abortion access, passing any laws uh, or many laws to, to, to uh, you know, really help uh, the, the people who we know will be impacted by this, especially in states where we know uh, maternal mortality rates are high. Uh, this is a discrepancy that the vice president has, has pointed out, continues to point out, in trying to help voters understand what the stakes uh, uh, really are headed into next year. But but really, uh, what people not only what people's access is to abortion, but to, to reproductive care uh, overall. Uh, right now, especially in that region of the country. You've got North Carolina just Saturday passing uh, a 12, I mean, uh, the 12-week ban that they passed going into effect after a federal judge. Let that go forward. There are very few places in the South right now uh, where people uh, you know, are able, able to get access um, to abortion in a timely manner, and clinicians are worried about what impact that's going to have uh, on safety and, and access to reproductive care. And we know that we've seen uh, Kelly Copeland in states that have banned abortion. You're also seeing OBGYNs leave the state and uh, people who are going through medical school declining to take residencies in states that have abortion bans because nobody wants to take a job in which they could be sued or end up in prison for giving people health care in abortion. Um, there's a 22 week ban right now. Patience, because you've had two back-to-back -back very far right-wing anti-abortion governors back-to-back, um, -back, um, your last two governors, Republican governors. Patients have to make two trips in order to get an abortion, and there has to be parental consent for minors. So uh, Ohio's already a tough state to get an abortion. Um, how is the mobilization going to try to get enough people, a critical mass, to vote in this off-year, off-month election to make sure that you don't wind up with a two with a 60% requirement to pass this initiative in November. Well, you're so right. I mean, Ohio is on the front lines of the for abortion rights in America this year. And that's mm -hmm. why the Ohioans for Reproductive Freedom, which I'm proud to be a part of, is a coalition of Ohioans who have, you know, put together thousands and thousands of volunteers who have collected hundreds of thousands of signatures. And we're gonna make history on Wednesday when we file those signatures to qualify for the ballot to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot in November for Ohioans to be able to say, we will never again 
be under the tyranny of abortion restrictions like we have been this time last year, where people were being forced to flee Ohio. But that will never happen again. And that's why we really need everyone's help. We need people to visit us at OhioansForReproductiveFreedom.org to find out how to get involved in this campaign. We're mobilizing thousands of people. And frankly, it would be great if people could chip in a few dollars, because as you mentioned, we're up against some billionaires who have no problem attacking democracy so that they can make the decisions for all Ohioans instead of us making them for ourselves. And we are determined, we are absolutely determined both to turn out the vote in August to vote no, and then in November to vote yes, because there's no circumstance that we will surrender to this tyranny, that we will give up our bodily autonomy, that we won't fight for our friends and neighbors whose lives literally depend on these two votes this year.